movewasteland.com. This is going to be another movie review, not necessarily a review per se, but going over a movie that depicts certain situations where we can come up with ideas to talk about and maybe perhaps lessons to be learned for should hit the fan survival, preparedness, things like that. As I say in all these videos, it should go without saying, but I know movies are fake, but it still gives us something to think about, come up with scenarios, some of which could happen in real life, and even if they couldn't, then it still gives us, you know, things to brainstorm about and ways we could relate or make us think of different things to prepare. So it can be useful exercises, certainly a little fun exercise to do. I like watching movies anyway, and there's a lot of stuff that it can kind of jumpstart in your brain to be like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, or at the very least, get it to where you've thought about these things in the past so that even if you don't come up with anything new, it's kind of a mental pathway that you've already created. So when that situation happens in real life, you have sort of almost like muscle memory where you've thought about this before. You can just go along with the conclusions that you've already made instead of being sitting there trying to make a decision for the first time. I'm going to be talking about things that happen in the movie throughout the whole thing. So as always, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I would suggest go watching it first. You don't necessarily have to to watch this video, but it would kind of ruin the movie for you if you haven't. So if you plan on seeing the movie, watch it first. If you like movie reviews and things like that, I do have a podcast with my girlfriend called Faint Praise where that is all we do. It's not prepping or preparedness related at all. It's strictly going talking about movies where we compare to usually bad movies of a similar theme and then just talk about them. But in this particular movie, the theme is nuclear survival. There is a blast in the big city. I'm not sure if it says, it might be New York or something. I'm not even sure if it says or if it matters. And most of the movie takes place in a semi-bunker, a basement beneath the building where a bunch of random people from the building have ended up there. And more of the movie is about the like dynamics that happen in this closed off, incredibly stressful situation. Most of the movie is about that, but there is obviously the problems related to a nuclear attack of any kind. And that's the stuff that I'm mostly going to talk about. I will deal with the interpersonal stuff a little bit, but this I want to specifically talk about the nuclear stuff. So in the beginning of the movie, the, the very opening of the movie, just jumps right into it, is what turns out to basically be the main character, this woman staring out the window, watching like multiple warheads coming in and destroying the city with nuclear explosions, you know, maybe two miles away or something like that, two or three miles away. So they are basically, the building that they're in is just on the outskirts of where everything is actually destroyed. And, man, if you're in that situation, all you can really do, if you're that close, is basically try to, and you don't have an actual bomb shelter of any kind that's designed for nuclear war or nuclear protection, all you can really do is hunker down in what would be, you know, the safest place. And then after that point, you would probably, unless you have pretty good shielding from radiation, you would want to just get out of there as quickly as possible. Try to survive the initial blast if you can, and then get out of the hot zone as quickly as you can. You're going to be dosed pretty bad regardless. And these people do end up in a basement of the structure, but you don't know how deep it is, what kind of concrete's better than simply wood or anything like that, certainly. Basically, when it comes to radiation, you distance is good, distance from the radiation that'll protect you, and then other materials, such as lead, is obviously really good. Anything denser is better than things that aren't dense, so concrete, even sand, is better than wood. Wood is better than nothing, you know? And you want to be able to stop the particles from getting in you and stop the particles from getting on you of anything that's irradiated. So if that includes air you breathe, you want to have some way to filter the air, hopefully, whether that's a gas mask or some sort of filtration system in your bunker, if that's where you're at. And for your and the water, you want to be able to filter water and any contaminated food, obviously. You wouldn't want to eat anything that could be potentially contaminated. And um, then you want to be able to prevent dust from actually getting on you. For short term, getting on you isn't nearly as big of a concern. If you were just to skedaddle out of the area immediately afterwards, something as simple as a poncho that you could just shuck off later would at least keep the stuff from staying on your skin, the, the contaminated dust. If I was in a situation like that where I was in the bunker of a building but it was that close, I might, I would definitely wait until the initial blast and settling was over. And then at that point, it depends. You know, if you have a gas mask and a way to filter the dust out, I would get out of there right away as quickly as possible. If you had, because just being that close, you would have to have a significant amount of shielding to justify waiting it out. When you're talking about like just on the outer edge, 
of the blast zone and everything's going to be covered with radiation. Sitting there for weeks or even a few days is probably not a good idea. I would rather take a, a higher dose running for five miles or whatever and just getting the hell out of her than staying there with improper shielding. If you had proper shielding, obviously, and proper filtration of air and everything, then you could just hunker down and wait for, I'm not sure how long it would take, but you would definitely not want to come out of there for probably a few weeks at least. So these people, they end up in a basement. It's not a shelter, but the, the landlord of the building is the one who's kind of outfitted this basement as like a prepper shelter. So it hasn't really been outfitted in any way that they mentioned specifically to protect it from you know radiation. They don't mention that he has any, I don't think they mentioned that he has any air filtration system, which is strange because throughout this whole movie, they're like smoking down there. I mean, if I was in a enclosed area with someone, and I'm worried about contaminated air coming in there to begin with, and they started puffing on a cigarette, I would be slapping that thing out of their hand so fast. And so the landlord played by Michael Bean is basically has outfitted this place to some extent. He's got a little bit of resources in there where you find, still they find out. The other people in there are all random. The main character and her, like, beta soy boy fiance, a couple, like, goofy bro dudes, one other woman, and um, a couple other dudes as well. And just a random assortment of people who lived in the building. So immediately after they all get in there, Michael Bean's character, the landlord or the super, not the landlord, the superintendent, he tapes off the door, which is, you know, it's good. You want to stop contaminated air from getting in there, but you also need to have some sort of airflow getting in there. This, this sub-basement is pretty big. It's multiple rooms and everything, but it's pr probably still only like a thousand square feet or 1500 square feet or something like that. And there's like six or seven people in there. And, um, you know, so the, the air has to be coming in somewhere or you're going to be suffocating. So in, initially, even if there was no other air input, you would probably still want to do that just until the, the, the it stopped being so dusty out there. And if you could, you know, there's ways you can maybe create positive air pressure inside that place that would keep dust from coming in with either canisters or maybe even fans or something like that. But um it's, it's not a bad idea, obviously, to block it off, but if you if that's the only way that air is getting in, that could be bad in another way. And if it's not the only way that air is getting in, then it might not matter anyway, unless the other way is filtered. I don't think, I watched the movie a few days ago, I don't think they reference any kind of filtration system. But they are still all puffing away at cigarettes, which is annoying and would not happen. <laughs> if I was there, I'd be like, no, cut that shit out. We're worrying about being in a closed area and contaminated air, you're not going to be blasting around cigarettes. The carcinogenic smoke. So as I mentioned, the Mickey character, which is the superintendent, he has some rudimentary preps. He has some food, some water, things like that. We find out later that he has quite a bit more of this in a, another area of the shelter that he doesn't want everyone else to find out, which was probably smart. But that leads me to my next point, which is at one point very early, a couple of the guys who end up being most problematic throughout the entire movie and end up going literally insane and everything and like raping and murdering people and stuff. They try, they want to get out. They're freaking out already and they just want to run out. And he's so worried, the superintendent is, about letting any of the contaminated air in that he like threatens and physically stops everyone from leaving. If I was in his situation, I would more than knowing that I had my own supplies, knowing that, you know, you might be there for a long time, I would not, first of all, I wouldn't have wanted to let anybody in there to begin with. And I would take the extra little dose of potential radiation. If they wanted to leave, I'd be like, this is it. I'm opening the door one time. Anyone who wants out, out, and you are not coming back in. I don't care what you say. And then they would be gone. And that would have changed the entire course of the movie because those guys that were trying to get out were um, the one, are the ones who end up causing the most problems. They have power throughout the movie, and I think it's supposed to be coming from some sort of cranking thing that they're doing, but they seem to be using quite a bit for any sort of manual crank device. I mean, I think there's also some kind of battery banks, so that's possible. They definitely probably should have come up with a more realistic way of the batteries being charged, but you don't know exactly how long they're going to but they're like watching movies on the uh, laptops and stuff like that, so if you've never done some kind of hand crank, or even bicycle crank. It takes a lot of cranking to generate even a modest amount of electricity. So you definitely wouldn't want to be wasting it on everything. It is a good preparation that the superintendent has to have any sort of electricity in there because you can't obviously can't count on electricity working or the grid working after such a nearby nuclear attack. Everything would be wiped out and uh, you would need to have some sort of alternative power source. So they do have lights, they have minor little electric things like that. And they have some food. He's being stingy with it in the beginning, which makes sense. They later find out about his extra stash, which is actually quite a bit. 
So after they've been down there for a while in the bunker, and obviously there's some growing tensions between the different characters in there, the all of a sudden they notice that there's some movement or noise outside the door and people are like cutting it open and the door opens and there's guys like military type guys in suits and they don't know if they're American or what they're not typical military suits in these big, you know, hazmat uh, kind of radiation suits, but they all have guns and they end up coming in and killing a couple people, <laughs> taking the daughter of the one woman and basically kidnapping her. And then the uh, the guy, the people in this underground location or whatever it is, and are able to kill I think one or two of those guys. So now they have a couple gas masks and suits and a couple guns. They never really explain in the movie exactly if these people were American soldiers, if they're invading from another country or what. Just kind of to make it even more weird. And like I said, mo the whole point of this movie is more about the internal conflicts that happen in the group because of such a crazy situation so they don't really explain it's up to you to determine what you think happened but it doesn't make any sense for it to really be americans and they they take the mask off one and the guy's asian but they don't know if the rest of them are or whatever he, they were speaking english when they were talking to the guy so they have you have no as a viewer and as the people in the movie have no idea what really is going on who who attacked and why and if these guys are part of that attack or if they're just part of some bizarre reaction from the government or what so eventually they end up blocking the door somehow and uh, the guys are on the outside. They decide to go out at some point and check and see what's going on out there. So one of the brothers puts on a uh, puts on one of the suits, takes the gun out there. They open up and all of a sudden the corridor is set up like a clean room basically where, or somewhere where you um, there's plastic everywhere and in the tunnel set up. So he's walking along the tunnel checking stuff out. What I would do at this point is I would definitely mark because there's branches in the tunnel. I would find some way even scratching with the a bullet, you know, the lead on the bullet or with a buddy rifle or anything to make marks to make sure I knew how to get back. And they just come upon this basically a lab where they're testing parts of the people for presumably for radiation. Well, you don't know what they're doing with the people. There's people in like tubes and stuff like that. He eventually gets spooked, ends up killing like one of the guys, but drops the gun on the way back, which is another thing I always mention in these videos. You cannot let your weapons down. So they run back into the bunker and they end up uh, welding him in from the outside. They like they block it so the guys can't come back in, but they realize that the whoever these guys are that came in there with the suits on have, are basically welding them inside this bunker, this basement, wherever they are. So they don't know, you know, if they ha ever have a way to get out after that. And that kind of enhances the stress of the situation, obviously. But at that point, if I noticed that they they still had at least one gun in the bunker from the two soldiers that they would killed so if they at that point if i realized that they were starting to weld the door shut i would just say all right grab the gun whip the door open right away try to pop that mini weld while it's still hot and then just blast who's ever standing there and take your chances because like once you're welded into this room what's your plan at that point what are you going to do you're just going to sit there and wait to die i'd rather take my chances going head on and taking out maybe five or ten guys that might be there probably more like two or three based on what he'd seen before and you could catch him pretty well off guard. One guy's going to be welding and not have a gun to begin with. There might be one or two guys covering him. So if you could just whip open the door right away, blast a couple of them, at least you could just try to make a break for it that way. So that would change the situation too, because obviously then you would want to try and get out of there as quickly as possible and not hang out. Because now you have to worry about the radiation and whatever this hostile force is. But at this point, they realize that whoever these people are, they're not interested in trying to get them anymore. They've gotten some people as samples for whatever they're doing, testing, and they're just going to leave them in there. So you, you, they don't know what they're going to do now at this point. They just start to devolve into all sorts of like mental disorders and everything else. So basically at that point, the rest of the movie is just an object lesson in not being a giant pussy because there's like two guys, one of the brothers and one of the, one of the other just men that's down there that start going just crazy. They literally start going crazy. They start torturing the Michael Bean character to find out. They realize he has more stuff somewhere and they torture him to get to it and everything, chop his finger off and whatnot. And they started like raping one of the women and abusing the other dude, like just ordering him around, doing all sorts of weird shit. And the other dude's like the, the brother of the one crazy guy and the fiance of the woman. They never do anything. They're pathetic. They don't do anything the whole time. They're like the type of guy who, like, once they have the gun, they can't even shoot and they get it taken away from them. It's just pathetic. And the woman, obviously, she doesn't do anything until near the very end. She finally goes nuts and takes out one of the guys with, like, metal from uh, the top of a can and, like, cuts his throat, which is one of the lessons is there's so many things you could use to, to make weapons, especially in, like, there's 
tools and things lying around. There is an axe lying around. But there's all sorts of stuff that you can make rudimentary weapons. And if you, if you realize that someone's going crazy like that, you can't just wait until they snap. You have to do something about it, even if it's just subduing them or something, locking them in a room, getting the other people to help you gang up on them once you've realized that they've lost it. Anything you can do to, to basically take care of the threat. So that's why it's always useful to have some sort of self-defense skills, have that sort of nonlinear thinking where you come up with different ways of doing things. Like, okay, you don't have a knife. What can you use to do to accomplish the same task? Things like that. And the, the woman, this is like a theme in some of these movies too. At one point, I forget what's happening. They're arguing about something and she takes the remaining weapon from that they got from these troops and throws it down this latrine because the guy had set up some kind of composting toilet in there and that's what they've been using the whole time. It's basically just an open septic tank, a, a, a vault toilet like they call them in some countries. And she like throws the M4 down in there and it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? First of all, I would make her go get it. <laughs> and then later, it turns out that obviously these guys started even going more crazy, so she would need the gun, but she never goes back down in there. Like, it gets incre incredibly, ins like, these people start going totally insane to where they're literally murdering people and stuff. You would it'd be worth it covering yourself in a little poo to get the uh, that weapon back and be able to take them out. It's not gone. It's just down there in the muck. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's there. Even you could fish it out with some string or something find some way to do it you know you wouldn't even have to jump in waist deep into that shit necessarily but even if you did it'd be worth it to get the weapon if you weren't if you didn't can come up with some way to take these guys out otherwise eventually stuff starts getting even more crazy and everyone ends up just kind of killing each other she finds that the main character woman finds out from the superintendent that he's like there's another way out you can get out through he says through the septic but obviously it's for some kind of sewer system there's another toilet in the his other like that was previously closed off bunker room with all his extra supplies and uh, he, um, you know, you can get, she gets out through there. She like, they end up having a kind of a final showdown where she ends up slicing the one guy's neck. A couple of other people who are left die. She, for some reason, she freaks out. And there's a couple people left, but she like closes, the place starts catching on fire and she like closes them off. There are people who were, they were being weak and pathetic, but they weren't necessarily the ones who were perpetrating the violence. But I guess she's like, no, fuck everybody, and just closes them off for whatever reason and lets them burn in there while she is, she grabs the mask and the remaining elements of one of these suits that she can get and gets out through this kind of sewer way. And then she just kind of, in the end, she comes out onto the city and realizes the epicness and kind of com total, totality of the devastation, and that's basically the end of the movie. So it's not a good movie if you really want to know what's supposed to happen. Like I said, it's all the entire movie takes place in this bunker, so it's more about the psychological aspect of how the, the group interacts in such an insane situation. But there's still some lessons that can be learned about, first of all, you want to have multiple people that you can trust. If you're not around people that you can trust, you want to realize that this type of stuff is possible. You have a plan to kill everyone you meet, as the man says, but you don't necessarily want to just enact that plan right off the bat. But if, they're, if you're given the opportunity to let hot-headed people, or pe even people that you don't really know that well, especially if they're going to be a physical threat to you, if you have an opportunity for them to leave and don't try to stop them, you know, even if it's going to increase your risk in the short term like that, let them get out of there. And, uh, and most importantly, though, would be thinking about the effects of the radiation in a situation like that. Because by the end of the movie, they're all succumbing to at least some radiation effects, which is obviously makes sense. Like I said, in that situation, I think it would be the best idea would be to try to survive the initial blast wherever you can, wherever you think is safest. And then use whatever protective methods you can and then just try to leave as quickly as possible. Because you're going to, like I said, you're going to be mega dosed no matter what if you're that close. So staying in a anything but a very well-shielded place is just going to give you a much more dose, I think. A much more worse dose, I think, than just trying to get out of there maybe on a bike or find any working vehicle within a few blocks and try to just get out of there as quickly as possible. If you, especially if you have a, an ability to filter, you know, some sort of gas mask, some sort of breathing apparatus that you can use to filter any t sort of particles out, I think it would be worth it. I don't know enough about radiation to know for sure how that, you know, the payoff would be of taking a much higher dose, but getting out really quick versus a lower dose over a period of days or weeks. But I'm guessing that the uh, getting out of there quicker would just probably be better all around, especially given the craziness of the situation. Now, the interesting thing to think about is going underground is usually the best bet. Once I, I put an article on my website, realwaysound.com, a while back 
about an e I think it was the EPA released a paper about you know shielding from a nuclear event of some kind and it has an interesting picture which I'll put up on the screen here about where you get the most and least radiation dosages basically in a building near some kind of nuclear event and the thing to consider is that most of this is related to like I said the shielding effect of various types of materials concrete versus wood versus lead versus just pure distance and then also looking where things settle you know where particles that are radioactive or irradiated would settle and thus be a radiation risk themselves so if you look at like up or up in the building is actually pretty good place to be shielded if you're in the center if you're a long distance from the edges and from the top and the bottom then that's a pretty good place to be but the upper levels that have their own roof or near the roof are not as good because all the particles will land on the roof. And if you notice on the edge of the tallest building there where there's another little roof area, the, the floors immediately adjacent to that are also very low, which is not good because of all that material that could be piled up there and you just have one wall separating you. So if you can't get into a basement, then you want to be able to get basically as far away or have the maximum shielding, whatever direction that's in, with the sides and the top and even beneath you if you can. If you have some kind of even sub-basement, the lower you can get the better simply because all that dirt on the edges and all the building above you offer a pretty good protection, pretty much the best you can get, especially if it's a big concrete garage or basement or something like that. And if you have um, air shielding, obviously that's going to be super important because it doesn't matter what um, level of shielding you have for the actual physical particles if you're still breathing them in. So, but you know, you have to maximize your situation to your advantage. You're not always going to be able to do something that had, that eliminates the risk. If you're, you know, that close to a nuclear attack, you're going to be kind of fucked no matter what. So you just have to try and maximize your situation. Another thing to make sure is that you have certain pieces of equipment. You know, I've mentioned gas masks. That's important if you have it. But one of the most important ones is the iodide tablets, potassium iodide, which prevents your uh, thyroid from collecting the radioactive iodide because it pretty much just blocks it off with this. You just take it preemptively. Like as soon as you know this might be an issue, you start taking these and it prevents, because that's one of the main issues of the radiation is that it will store up in your thyroid. So this prevents that, which can go a long way to helping you uh, eliminate the risk of radiation poisoning. And links to all this stuff will be in the description below. And then this was in one of the battle boxes. This is actually a water filter for that it filters out radiological contamination, which is super useful. So if you were trying to bug out of there and uh, you know there was some water sources that you wanted to try and drink from, but they were outside already, maybe you run at you ran out of the water that you had with you already, and you need to try to get some more. This a normal water filters are not going to filter out radiological material, so you would have to get one specifically designed for that. And this is one of those, and link will be in the description for that too. Of course, there's other little meters, you know, Geiger counters, a uh, emergency dosimeter, which tells you what kind of levels you're at, things like that, wipes to get rid of contaminated particles off of you. But even something as simple as like rinsing off, you know, it's, it's usually it's just dust and things like that. So like I said, you don't want it in you, you don't want it on you. So even something like a poncho or a Tyvek suit, you know, like the hazmat suit, but it doesn't have to be quite as sealed as because you're not trying to necessarily block you know, virus-sized particles, you just literally don't want that stuff on you, on your body. And you want an ability to be able to take off that suit and have all the stuff go come off with it. And then obviously the gas mask is probably the most important part because that's the hardest thing to, to kind of um, improvise. You can improvise white cup physical coverings, you know, a tarp, a shower curtain, anything would be some kind of protection. But it's really hard to improvise an effective air filter. So that's something that you do want to do ahead of time. The Prep Setter channel had a pretty good video about the modern, you know, gas masks that are up to that NVC capabilities. And because, you know, with the older milk surplus stuff, those things are obviously designed to work. They do work. But some of those things are so old that you never know if, if they're still going to be effective. So if you have the money, it's good to go ahead and get one that's, that's new. It's not always a possibility because they're going to be a couple hundred bucks, but it's definitely the best solution for that issue. So that's pretty much it, guys. Let me know what you think. If you think you would be able to kick some ass if everyone started going crazy in a bunker, I know I would sure as hell try. That's the one thing that I always recommend to everyone is you're not going to win every fight you get into, especially in a crazy situation like this. You might be weak and you might be injured. They might be badass. You just do black belts, you know, or just huge guys or whatever. But 
at least give him a fight, man. Don't go out like some wussy soy boy who's just going to mm, let people like slap you and tell you to do all sorts of crazy shit and you just do it. At least give him a fight. That's what I always tell people, man. When you like people aren't afraid to fight some a small person, but they're afraid, afraid to fight an even smaller animal like they would. There's a lot of guys out there who wouldn't think twice about like trying to attack a guy who weighs 120 pounds. So I think this tiny dude. But they, if a squirrel that weighs one pound starts chasing them, they're going to be like, whoa, and, you know, run away from it. And the reason is because they know that no matter what, that even though they grab that squirrel and twist it in half of their bare hands, they're going to get messed up at least a little bit. It's going to bite. It's going to scratch. It's going to claw at them. They're going to get injured. There's no way to get out of a fight with a squirrel or a cat or even a chicken or a goose without getting at least somewhat injured. So make sure that they know that you're the same way, that even if they're guaranteed to win the fight, they are going to uh, get some kind of damage inflicted on them. And that'll make them at least a little more reluctant, potentially a lot more reluctant, because if you're not super tiny or super weak and you make it clear that you are going to put up a good fight, they might even not be convinced that they're going to win. And that will change the whole tide of the interaction. And if you, if you find yourself in a situation like a crazy situation, like in this movie, where you realize it's not going to get better, you realize things are going to start getting really crazy, then you need to probably act first to begin with. That doesn't necessarily mean taking them out or anything, but do something to prevent, to either, you know, restrain them, get them out of there, make sure everyone else is on your side and is aware of something like that. Don't, don't just be reactive. You want to be proactive. So that's the most things I have to say about this movie. Kind of a crazy movie. Definitely gets a little violent and graphic and things like that, but that's interesting. I like that kind of stuff. But I definitely prefer movies that, that feature more of the actual shit hit the fan scenario too, and not just the you know psychological dynamics. But it's good to get that. So let me know what you guys think if you've seen this movie, and if you are if there's any other lessons that you think could be learned from this. With the nuclear stuff, like I mentioned, it's difficult because it's just a really really bad situation, and trying to come up with a perfect solution is probably impossible if you're that close to a nuclear attack, unless you have a full blown bomb shelter set up already with air filtration, with stockpile, sufficient shielding, then you're just going to have some, at least some ill effects from this, if not just be completely doomed. But you always still want to do everything you can. It's what we do. That's what prepping is all about. So let me know what you guys think. Check the links in the description. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you later.